Hello, everybody. It's a great pleasure today to be live with Rabbi Shaul Yudkovich, who is an expert in Kabbalah. He's built up Kabbalah communities in Canada, in Florida, in Israel. And um, what I love about your approach, Rabbi Shaul, is that you make um, this what could be a complicated subject into something that's really understandable for the average person. And also, um, you make it relevant to today and to what we're going through and what's, what our lives have changed, of course, dramatically over these last couple of years. So apparently you had a science background. Uh, what got you into uh, astrology and the understanding of astrology? So uh, I was a biologist. I was doing uh, biology in the research in Tel Aviv University. And at that time, if you asked me about astrology, I thought it's all nonsense because, you know, what kind of astrology did I uh, was exposed to? Like something you read in the newspapers doesn't sound like really uh, uh, <laughs> something that a scientist can support and understand. So I even didn't have any a thought about the direction of astrology. However, when uh, there was a stage, I started to study Kabbalah because I felt that uh, as an Israeli, as a Jew, I, um, I have no idea what it is. And it's like, you know, my vision was like your grandmother left you a heritage. She left you a treasure box in the attic, never bothered opening it. And so I said, like, you know, I studied other stuff. You know, I know I studied the, the, the Tanakh, the Torah. The Bible, I studied Talmud, but I have no idea what Kabbalah is about. So I took a course and then I was in shock. As a scientist, I realized that Kabbalah is something that is so different than anything else. It's not that it's another religion or it's another wisdom. But when you study Judaism, there are four layers of understanding reality. And these four layers, the first one is called the simple, you know, how long did, does, does it take for you to know who's the person? You, you meet the person, and some people say, within an instant, I already know the person. You know, and you pay for it for the rest of your life. Why? Because the simplistic understanding is very, uh, in Hebrew, the word is pshat, simple, but it's the same letters as tipesh, a fool. Only a fool can trust his first instinct. You have to make a research. So there are, there, are so there are other two layers of uh, learning, understanding. The fourth and the last of them is called the secret, Kabbalah, which means what's the real meaning behind stuff? Because, uh, how should I say, there's nothing in this world that cannot be explained, that's according to uh, the Kabbalistic teachings, by understanding how the universe is structured. Yeah, the universe has a structure, Nothing happens by coincidence, which is coincide, but there is a big plan behind it. And if you understand that plan, then you, you are much in a much better place of understanding your life, reality, and why do things happen? Okay, so, uh, you know, even then, by the way, m most people don't know that the study of Kabbalah was, the be was behind the great... Uh, explosion in scientific research in Europe in the 16th, 17th century. For instance, like go to Sir Isaac Newton, right? He was a he was a big student of Kabbalah. He said by himself that the secrets that are encoded in the five books of Moses they contain all the rules of the universe, including modern physics. Same with Leibniz, who he brought to the world more than uh, calculus, he said the same thing. Uh, those people uh, were students of Kabbalah and that somehow initiated modern research because when you study Kabbalah, you know whatever happens has a reason. And the human brain is capable of researching the reason. And when you understand the reason, it's much easier to understand your life, the, the whatabouts of your life, and then you can come to better harmony with yourself and the universe 
when you simply understand the basic rules of what motivates everyone. There is a law that there are rules. It's, it all can be simplified in, uh, in, in the kind of equations. And most of the people were behind the modern study of uh, science had knowledge of Kabbalah, even Da Vinci and all of these uh, great scholars of uh, that ba basically were the founders of modern science. So I could relate to that as a scientist. Finally, somebody gave me answers. Okay. And as I'm studying that, then I realized that there is astrology also in Kabbalistic studies and you can find it all over Jewish writings. And I simply just somehow the last century or two in uh, Europe, most rabbis were like, uh, you know, astrology, it's not something you should spoke, speak about, same as reincarnation, because you lived in an environment that basically look at that stuff as something that is really either heresy or uh, prejudice without any uh, scientific background. So, uh, when, but as you study uh, a little bit of astrology from the Kabbalistic aspect, then you start to see that it's everywhere, that it is encoded, spoken about all over the Bible, because if you study the biblical calendar, it's all astrological. You cannot understand the biblical calendar without understanding astrology. Okay, for instance, when, when you celebrate Passover, and Passover is about coming out from slavery to freedom. Passover must be in the Jewish calendar, the biblical calendar, Passover must be on the full moon after the uh, uh, after uh, March 21st. Okay, March 21st, that's right the beginning of Aries. Passover yes. will always be in the full moon in Aries. Now, what's the Aries? The Aries is about slavery to your own ego, to all your own self-centeredness, and getting out of the Aries, and then going into a journey of seven weeks, and then you get the Torah of Mount Sinai in Gemini. And what's the symbol of the Mount Sinai revelation? The two tablets. Why two? God could not write with a smaller font on one tablet. Why do you need two tablets? But what's the symbol of Gemini? It's me and you. It's the two who are one. Love others as you love yourself. So the whole thing of the, uh, the Torah is about getting out of the self, the egotistic uh, childish self, which is Aries, and reaching out to the place in which you realize that the other person uh, completes you and you're not one without him. And that's Mount Sinai Revelation. And so it's amazing when you understand the values from this point of view. Okay, so there's a lot of other stuff in the biblical calendar, and that's why the biblical calendar is astrological, and it's lunisolar, like the astrological uh, calendars of the Far East. You know, the uh, the uh, the uh, Indian, the Chinese. All of the Far East calendars who are very, very uh, inclined into astrology, they are lunisolar, okay? The same as the Hebrew calendar, the biblical calendar. And why lunisolar? When you understand that the whole world is about the polarity between the male and the female aspects. There is the creator, he is the male aspect. There is the creation, which is the female aspect. And the whole astrological story is the dance between the two forces in our lives and the relationship between the two. Now, the moon symbolizes humanity, the creation, because the moon has no light of its own. It's, it has only what it reflects. Same thing, a human being has no light of its own, only what you reflect to others. Whatever you take just for yourself, that's a black hole. Okay, and a black hole has no, uh, as it, it's, it's not something that you can live upon. You need to learn to reflect, and whatever you have is basically whatever you gave and shared with others. On the other hand, the sun, which represents the ongoing 
bliss of the creator that always shines, even at night. You know, when we turn our back to the uh, sun, we have night. The sun never, se never sets, really, because the sun shines always. Same thing, the light of the creator is endlessly giving and sharing, never judging. It's only us. We can turn our back to it. We can face it. That depends on us. So our behavior is what generates bliss or, you know, curse or anything that's only depending on our behavior. The same thing as the dance between the moon and the sun in the, uh, in the heavens, our heavens. So you see that the lunar solar calendar is based on very deep understandings. And also, if you look at the, uh, the calendar, you see that the zodiac calendar, like the year, can be divided into four sections of 91 days. The, 19, the number 91 in a Kabbalistic teachings is a magical number because the number uh, 13 is a number that symbolizes love. Why? 12 is the 12 signs of the zodiac. That's nature. Really, truly loving somebody else, you have to get out of your nature. That's a number 13. So the number, number 13 is a symbol of unity. The real unity is only when you get out of your selfishness, you get out of your own childish, Aries thinking. Every baby is born like this. They don't think about anybody else, just about themselves. Then comes the terrible twos, because that's when, why it's terrible, if they realize they have to consider somebody else and they rebe rebel. Why is it I have to think about somebody else? Till I was selfish, that was okay. No, it's not okay. You have to get out of yourself in order really to bring in the godly light of the creation. So uh, the number 13 symbolizes oneness, unity, and love. And also, uh, you know, in Hebrew, every letter is a number. So when you take the, the, the word for one, unity is echad, those three letters come together to uh, 13. It's 1, 8, and 4, 13. And also the name, the word Ahava, love, it's 1, 5, 2, and 5, 13. Caring, the Aga, that's also 13. So 7 times 13 gives you 91. 91 days in every season. It's also... The, the godly names that represent the male aspect of the creation, okay, that's 26, twice love, right? Or love, love one love, that's 26. With the name of God that represents the creation, the female aspect, that's 65. 65 plus 26, 91. So every season is another unity between the upper worlds and the lower worlds, the creator and the creation, the moon and the sun. Okay? So you can see that happening everywhere in the Hebrew calendar. The holiday love in the Hebrew calendar, that's the full moon in Leo. Why it is the holiday of love? Because the Leo, we know that the, in Leo, uh, this is the, uh, the highlight of the sun, right? It's a sun a sun sign, okay, it's ruled by the sun. That's also the midsummer, okay. So the sun is on its peak. The moon has a peak once a month. When the peak of the sun and the moon coincide, that's a full moon in Leo, and that's the holiday of love in the biblical holiday, the biblical calendar. That's so you see again the connection, the convergence of female male energies coming together in a full moon in Leo, and that's when it's celebrated. Today it's very popular in Hebrew in Israel. There are more celebrations on this day than on Valentine's Day. Because you know it's a summer holidays and everybody's outside. So everybody celebrates the holiday of love in the full moon of Leo. That's by the way when I met my soul. Okay, on that day. So wow. Ian, I know it before, but I never realized that the, the click happened on that, started on that day. So we got married a few months later. So you have like a, a lot of that inside uh, Jewish teachings. 
And when, only when you learn really Kabbalah, then you start to understand it has an order. It has a very, very precise understanding. And then only that's with the time that I realized that Aries is Aries, not just because somebody said, but there are formulas that show you why Aries must be an Aries, which means all the uh, and you can all the uh, the um, traits that Aries have. You can find the sources for it from the biblical text and from the uh, Kabbalistic explanations of what's the difference between one zodiac sign and another. What kind of forces come together to generate that? power that we call it Aries. And what does it mean for every human being? Okay, so that's why the whole thing of Passover, which is a full moon in Aries, that you take the lamb and you slaughter it, which the lamb is the Aries, right? It's the ram. And basically the symbol was to take your own ego and to overcome it. So today we don't have this this tradition but we have the eating of the matzah you know the unleavened bread and what's the unleavened bread if we know that the biggest problem of a human being is the ego and the aries is the beginning of the ego in the zodiac system so the bread is a symbol of the ego why you take the flour you add water and it soaks and it soaks and it soaks and then it rises right like the ego so what do you do you do not let it leaven you bit if you if somebody who've been to a matzah factory where they make it the moment they water they bring the water into the uh flour they start beating it up like they they beating it like crazy till it gets to the oven as a cracker it doesn't rise it's being beaten up so you have kind of the opposite of the ego by suppressing it so that's why the kabbalistic uh, teachings say that the matzah is basically a, a a medication against ego that's why for these seven days you have a healing from your own ego your own childishness childness being childish and then you can start the journey of growing up till you can face the other human being in front of you and really being able to relate to him and that's mount sinai revelation seven weeks later so you see those astrological concepts everywhere in the hebrew uh, biblical calendar wow fascinating uh, rabbi yeah. sure what about taurus then in the middle between what happens uh, we've got the seven weeks between aries and gemini what about the sign yeah. of taurus in between is there anything you can so say in about order to get in order to get out of your uh, uh of your uh, childishness uh, all of this selfishness which is called um in the in the kabbalistic teachings as, as you know you're right now katan katan means you're small like a little kid no responsibility you do what you feel like you don't care whatever you want to say whatever you want to take you take you know that's a typical aries stuff you know who are you to tell me what what to do the taurus uh we know there is there are a lot of things about materialism about taurus but they in the kabbalistic teachings there are a lot of concepts of love in taurus okay first of all you yes. have venus which is the planet of love now in the hebrew uh, astrology it's not just a sexual love it's basically the whole thing you know of harmony and beauty that's what love is about correct so it's the whole month is about the energy of love the energy of uh spiritual love of unity and um, so you have that embedded in the name the name of the month in the hebrew uh let's say of the hebrew uh, astrological chart is the you know show the ox now if you take the hebrew word for Taurus, the numerical value for that is 502. And 502 is, is the same number as unconditional love. So 
the Taurus, the whole thing of Taurus is breaking from materialism and rising to unconditional love, learning how to listen to somebody else. And therefore, it's called a month that is full of light. So there's a name in the Hebrew calendar. The name is Iyar. Iyar means the month of light. Uh, Venus in Hebrew is Noga, which means it's another name for uh, glamour, like the shining light. Okay, so you have a lot of gay, or oh, there's a biblical name, Ziv, which is another name for light. It's, there's so many words around this, the net of the month of Taurus, that there's so much light in this month. Now, the point is, you have a choice. You can be very materialistic, and because you think that you can capture the light in materialistic um, things like real estate, money, buildings, uh, art, and stuff like this, or food, or you can, and it will never satiate you, basically, because that's all, uh, you know, it can really not uh, satiate you for long. Or you get out of it and you reach that place of unconditional love, and then you realize that that's the only thing that is your real uh, standing assets that you can take with you anywhere you can. So uh, that's why, basically, the state of Israel has been uh, declared in Taurus. Okay, why? The, the, when you ask in all of the Jewish writings, why did the Jewish nation go into exile? Okay, so nobody says the Romans were bad colonialists. They came, they took our country, destroyed the land. Nobody says that, although that's a historical fact. The question is, why did it happen to us? And the answer is, we didn't love each other unconditionally and therefore we were split and separated we didn't like each other we hated each other and therefore that would that's what happened to us so how do you correct that uh that stuff of hatred you have to be built on unconditional love and that's a correction of the Taurus to learn to love unconditionally without the materialistic bonding and conditioning wow do you work at all with the nodes of the moon because of course the north the north node is in taurus now so there's a like a collective move towards this taurus energy um i don't know if you work with those nodes i, did, I don't i do not work with that because i did not specialize in uh the details of the hebrew astrology uh i didn't have, have time for that uh, because it's a huge body of knowledge which is dated all the way back do you know who to who's the first no. astrologer abram the patriarch okay. wow. abram now he starts if you go to jewish sources he was first of a uh, his first career was astronomy and astrology in the city he grew up at in the ancient culture civilization of Sumer, Sumer, right? So he established, he was one of the people that established the ancient Babylonian astrology. Being an astronomer, being an astrologer, and he basically uh, knew all of that stuff that we know about astronomy and astrology. However, God, if you read Genesis, showed him there's another way. And the story is, if you go to uh, Genesis ch uh, chapter 25, if I'm not mistaken, so you see over there when God promises Abraham, uh, you know, a, a bright future, children and stuff, and the whole nation will come out of you, nations. And Abraham says, how would I know? Which means, uh, basically, as an astrologer, he, he saw in his chart, you know, never mind that he was very old and his wife, Sarah, we're very old. That's nature. Okay, they went to the doctor. The doctor said, you're too old, you guys, to have a child right now. No, he's looking at his chart. He cannot have a child. And then God's answer, if you read in the book of Genesis, it says, and God took him out. Out of what? Out of the tent? And he says to him, look at the stars. If you can count them, so you'll be you're going to be your offsprings. And what does it mean 
took him out. So the Jewish teachings is about that the first time a human being was taken out and above the zodiac signs and said to him, you can go above it. Yes, according to the stars, you cannot have a child. But as a human being, when you change your nature, you change also the way the stars affect you. So you can change your chart. So that's a very, very uh, important aspect. Not that there are no, as no there are, uh, a thing of there's no astrology, but if you go, let's say, to one of the most uh, famous stories about it, that goes like almost 2,000 years ago in the Talmud, a story about Rabbi Akiva, one of the greatest sages of the second century in Israel. And he was the greatest leader and so on. And he says that when he had a daughter, the astrologers did her chart and they said to him, on the night of a wedding, she will die from a bite of a snake. Okay? Now, if it was a Greek tragedy, uh, it will be that he will lock her out on a tower on a desolated island. Okay? So she will never see a man. She will never get married. She will never be killed and so on and so forth. And then one day there will be a storm and a handsome young man walking on the beach, hides in a tree. The wind picks him up in the air and on the princess balcony. She wakes up in the morning. She sees him. She treats him. She falls in love. She gets married to him and she dies by the snake. That's Greek, right? Which means he can't run away from your destiny. Not with Rabbi Akiva. It says he even taught her about it. And she cared about it, it says. And then came the wedding. And in the morning, she wakes up and she's alive. She dresses up and then suddenly she realizes a dead snake next to her dresser. That she, by mistake, it seems to be that she killed him the night before. So she screams, everybody comes in. And, and Rabbi Akiva is asking her, what did you do, my daughter, to be saved? And she said like this, in... Most Jewish weddings, the bride and the groom fast that day before the wedding. They don't eat till after the ceremony. So she was fasting, and then there was a ceremony. She sat down to eat with all the guests, with the whole celebration, and then she noticed there's a poor man by the door asking for food, but all the way they were so busy, busy with all the important guests, they, had, they couldn't see him. So she took her food and she gave it to the poor man. So Rabbi Kiva said, that's a proof that charity can save from death. Okay? When you give out of your way, then your chart is changing out of its way. So that's one of the major stories in Jewish tradition about, yes, the stars, that it's all written in the stars. However, it doesn't mean that that's the way it's going to be. When you change who you are and when you get out of your chart by being a giving person, when you learn how to live with unconditional love, the way your chart is going to be manifested is going to be different than the ways you were born with it. So you have a lot of control over the way the energies of your birthday and your birthday chart can manifest in your, during your life. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah, we're not the defect of, of the stars. Uh, somebody was saying, isn't the number 13 we've been taught as unlucky? Yes, sometimes people say 13 is not a lucky number. So why would that have been drummed into us? You know, it's not in the, wherever I studied. I didn't see any source for that. I cannot explain something that somebody else brought from I don't know where from. But I figure out that... A lot of people do, are afraid from getting out of themselves. A lot of people are afraid of going above their chart, their nature, their selfishness, and that's in like uncharted terrain. You know, when if I'm not taking care of myself, who will take care of myself? You're right, you should take care of yourself. But you, if you really want to understand the only way to really take care of yourself is basically get out of yourself and be there for others because that's how you bring in godly light 
into your life. And that's how you rise above and, and correct all the stuff that you came with to this world. Yes, your chart will tell you why did you come to this world, but it cannot tell you what's going to be with you for the rest of your life because you're supposed as a human being to rise above your nature. And if you are still in the same, you know, the same cycle of 12, and so why are you here? What are you here for? You're missing your destiny. You're missing your calling as a human being. We're here to change. We're here to transform. We're not here to be perfect, but we're here to perfect. Okay? Don't expect, yes. you know, people are not perfect. They're not supposed to be perfect. But they're supposed yes. to perfect, to be creative, and so on. And that's how we connect to our godly source, all of us. And so each of the individual astrology signs has a different lesson or a different message, like Taurus, yes. for example, getting away from the materialism. What's Gemini getting away from? Uh, yeah, so Gemini, uh, because it is an air sign, okay, and Gemini is a, is not just an air sign. In Maybe another time I'll explain, but there are three yes. layers of every every zodiac sign kabbalistic teachings has three layers it's like a kaleidoscope of the four uh, the four elements so according to kabbalistic astrology uh, all three signs of the of the spring in the core there are fire signs why the spring is under the power of fire so that's why you see that every stores and gemini are very energetic okay very creative very like the energy is very strong with them they never have a dull moment it's always moving forward creating and doing that's a fire and also selfishness okay that you find deep inside them now but there's another cycle of the what in you know your astrology the western astrology of the cardinal the fixed what's the name of the other one the last one mutable 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 exactly so but in the Hebrew calendar, they are called right, left, and center, which means the first one is more inclined towards uh, the energy of loving kindness. The second, which is water, the second one in every in every season is more inclined towards fire, which is called left column, selfishness and self centeredness and also desiring stuff like fire, which fire consumes. The moment fire stops eating, it's gone. So all fire signs, it's about, you know, how can I take? Because I have to consume. I don't exist without taking. And then the third one, the mutable, is always about the air looking for balance. Right? Balance. So if you look at the Gemini, you have double air and one fire. There is a lack of emotions right we know that the tikkun the correction of the gemini is you know don't just be busy with the uh, with being interested with all the knowledge and the stuff and the gossip that's happening around just just slow down and feel be there for others genuinely not just because they're interesting as a you know you know like an, a journalist He's very interested in you for maybe uh, till he published the article. After that, he forgot about you and doesn't care anymore. He moved on already. Okay? So, you yes. know, that's why Gemini's, it's very hard for them to create a real intimate relationships because it's boring. Okay? Mm -hmm. And you know what? When you just stay on the shallow surface, that's your life will be boring forever. You'll never find peace. You'll have to find the intimate, real feel inside by realizing that it's, you know, when it's boring, it's because you're boring yourself. You're not changing. So you're looking for external change in replace of your real need for change inside and being there for others, and which is not so easy for uh, Gemini's. That's great. I love the way you're explaining this because, of course, in our individual charts, we have every sign within it. Yes, yes, yes. some yes. more That's accentuated also than the Kabbalistic chart. That's also so. in the Kabbalistic chart. Of course, it's not, there's no different. There was, 
uh, the main book of, of astrology in Judaism is called the Book of Formation. And the Jewish tradition says the person who wrote it was Abraham the Patriarch. Okay, so it's, it's a 4,000 years book, right? 4,000 years old. And it speaks about the structure of the universe. Now, this book is very important. It's not very long. However, it's written like a riddle. And the commentator of these books were some of the greatest rabbis in the history of Judaism. So when you read their commentaries, which is full of astrological information, one of the famous books, uh, the commentaries on this, on this, on the uh, Book of Formation, was written in, I think it was, yeah, the 10th century by a great rabbi. His name was Rabbi Shabtai Donolo. He lived most of his life in the south of Italy. Okay, and those days, still like the 16th century, most rabbis were rabbis, mathematicians, astrologers, astronomers, and doc and phys and physicians, all in one, uh, all in one. And so mm -hmm. he said, Rabbi Shabtai Donol, in, in the opening introduction to his book, says that he wanted really to check all different ways of astrology uh, schools of astrology so and you he said you cannot really study that if you don't study it in the original language so he studied the uh the uh uh all different kinds of astrology the babylonians the he studied a lot of text and he said that after he studied all of them i realized there's no difference big difference between them and the Kabbalistic astrology. There's not so much difference. However, there's one difference, which it says in uh, one of the, ma the major book of Kabbalah is called the Zohar, the book of splendor. That's something from the second century. And it says over there that the difference between most astrologies and the biblical astrology is that the biblical astrology is about... Uh, let me turn it around. Most astrologies is that astrologers of the different cultures and schools, they know how to use the wisdom of astrology, which means they know how to apply your birth chart with, you know, what's going on with your life and how do you understand and analyze your nature, okay? That's, it's very common. However, the biblical astrology is based on knowing the creation of the stars why is it like this why aries is like this why planet mars which is the ruling planet of aries is why is it red why is it the planet of wars okay what made it to be like this so when you know the dna it's much easier to understand it control it and rise above it Okay, so that is when you, the more you understand your DNA, spiritually, psychologically, and physically, the more ability you have to transcend, transform, and change. And you know, if a human being does not change, when you read somebody's chart, and you realize it's exactly the same way he was born, it's like he didn't change. That's really humiliating. It's like, so why, what are you here for? What, what have you done all of these years? You just ate what? Like like a beast, as the sages are saying, or they, they um, I think it was pro Isaiah. The pro it's like you're like a beast, you're eating straw. And what do you understand? Nothing. You just, if you have enough straw and grass, that's okay with you. But you're a human being that will never satisfy you. You always need to transform. So never complain about the chart or the destiny you've been given at your birth never complain about it do something with it create something out of it because you always have so many treasures and astrology can help you find the treasures and then you can develop them and find your calling and then when you apply it that's when you really achieve true lasting fulfillment which is that's what we're all looking for nothing else absolutely oh this is this is amazing would you mind people are asking about their signs can we go briefly through 
the rest of the signs because yeah, the answer so that, thank you if you have the time yeah, yeah of okay. course but that's you know i cannot give more than that you can go to my site and you have uh, yes. uh, more explanations but uh, of course yes 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 but a specific so, question okay so um you you were saying um that there's a reason for everything yes we've right. been we're, we're, if you understand the science behind the kabbalah the this this scientific reasoning um then presumably there was a reason for the pandemic that we've been through or maybe coming through can of that course. be identified could you could you speak to that a little yes uh the point is like this it's when uh the the holy zohar is saying that when people engage into a lifestyle of uh how should i say it's called it's a lifetime of it's called the male judgment in the kabbalistic language what is male judgment we have to understand the creator himself is endless and therefore he never says no his energy is uh projected in the un to the universe all the time without any stop now so what's the problem with that that so why aren't we happy all the time why aren't we full of bliss all the time the answer is that if you go to Genesis chapter one, we were created in his image. And of course, the endless creator has no physical image. So we can talk only about a mental image. So what's the mental image of a creator? And I can minimize it into three very simple traits. One, independence. Okay, the creator needs no one. And we cannot change him because he's endless. So our actions can never change him, correct? And the same thing you see that people has, have a need because of that, that will never be satiated, but it's a need only by our own change of behavior, and that is the need to be independent. You never see needy, dependable people happy, right? It's, a, it's an oxymoron. Why? Because it's against our being. We were created in the image of the creator. Therefore, we need independence. Okay? So we have to develop a lifestyle in which we are emotionally and spiritually independent and our happiness is unconditional. The moment I'm waiting for someone or something to make me happy, that will be misery, lasting misery. Okay? So that's independence. The second trace is creativity. Look at the universe. It's amazing creation, correct? So colorful and so smart. We need to create in order to connect to our own being, self-being. So it's very hard to find happy, lazy people, right? The happy people are very creative and very, you see the variation of, you know, creativity and that goes along with happiness. And the third one is sharing and giving. The creator is giving. He gave it all to us. We have nothing that is not from him, right? So, but what's, what's, what's wrong with that? Because there's something wrong with that. The, so the, 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 the Jewish basic teaching is, yes, the creator is giving endlessly, okay? The problem is the moment your nature is of a creative being, you cannot be given ha a happiness by someone else, not by, by the creator, not by anyone. No one can make you happy, only yourself. So can the creator give us all the bliss and will that will be happy and that will be okay? That happened already. The, the, you know, you just go back to Genesis chapter one and it says there was a night, there was a day, one day. And when there's a one, there's no other. Everything was already perfect, perfectly created from God's point of view. Everything was given. We have it all. What's the problem? We can take it because, you know, you cannot have a gift that will make you have really happy. You need to create your own success, your own happiness. So God did us a favor. He broke the perfection. That was the second day. 
You read Genesis chapter 1. What did God do on the second day? He broke everything. He separated. He split. Why? So we can put things together and feel good about ourselves. Because we created it. So that's what this world, this universe is about. So here we are. It's about creativity. It's about independence. And all the zodiac charts, all of that stuff is about us learning how to overcome our faults, our mistakes, and it's not bad. It's like, if what is our creativity? First of all, I had some emotional issues. I, so I fixed it. How do I feel about my life? Victory. I feel fulfilled. No one can take it away from you. Okay? So you look at the chart and you see what is your journey? Where are the places, right? You, you are, Let's say you're a land developer. And you go to uh, the middle of Manhattan, okay? So you look around, wherever there are already perfectly built buildings, it's not for you, right? What's for you? You're looking for some falling apart old buildings, places that nobody took care of, and you can make a big fortune out of it. Same thing about us. You look at your chart and you see all of those places that looks eh, not so good. Oh, I can build over here something amazing and feel great about it. And not sitting and complaining, oh, I was born with this chart. No. Okay, so the, 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 so the story is basically that we are given a life full of challenges, full of, uh, let's say, chaotic events and situations and challenges for us that the Creator created this playground, which is called life upon earth, so we can create the perfection out of the lacks and the imperfection and the pain and the dark stuff and so on. And that's basically what we're here for. So every zodiac sign is, and you know, it's not just the zodiac sign, it's also the rising sign. The whole chart is giving me uh, a, basically the plan, where should I build? Because the places that I'm weak, that's where I can be stronger and feel great about myself. And that's the creativity. That nobody can take away from you if that answers yes yes that's that's wonderful so in terms of um the collective um energy oh, oh, let's go to the uh, right. corona this is great thank you what you shared was wonderful wonderful yes so the moment we ask the creator for excitement and happiness we get it he never says no the problem is when we get it, our souls are like, did you forget what we're here for? We're not here for free gifts. So when people are running like crazy, the Lord says, looking for high and excitement without paying any price for it, that creates the male judgment. It's like the male energy of the creator coming in and starts to fry humanity the result will be a pandemic because that will cool down the fire. Everybody went home, slowed down, and had to think about it. Go to your room and think why you're here. A lot of people, because of that, realized that they were living in a lie. They were running like crazy, making money, career, and they didn't really like it. They were taking antidepressants, uh, tranquilizers, uh, drugs, alcohol. That's not really fulfilling. So the whole pandemic was because humanity globally was into a crazy race of how can we get high, fast, and furious, right? And the result was a pandemic. So that was a direct thing. Now, also... We live right now in a decade that in the Kabbalistic astrology, the whole calendar, also by years, we are, yes, it's the age of, of, of Aquarius. Aquarius. Yeah. It's also, it's basically what is Aquarius? It's about, first of all, like as the prophets, when you read Isaiah, when it says, when it says in Isaiah, and in a future day to come, and the lamb will live together with the leopard right yes. and the snake and how would that happen you go on reading the same prophecy and prophecy and it says 
when the knowledge will flood the world like water covered the sea. It's the Aquarius is the age of knowledge, right? This is why one the great one of the greatest um, moments of the age of this age was 1990, right? When we start with the uh, cell phone and the internet, okay? And you see, like it's like we since the dark ages, we have every 250 years we have a big leap of getting out of closeness, and you open up. So the Iron Curtain fell. All the walls of spreading wisdom and knowledge. 250 years earlier, you had the, uh, the Industrial Revolution. 250 years earlier, you had the discovery of America and the way to India and then Reformation. And it's like you see those changes of what? Spreading of wisdom and knowledge so it will cover the, the world like water covered the sea the access that people would have to wisdom and to knowledge, that's the redemption of humanity from its problems. Because when you, when you don't know, when you're ignorant, what, what kind of tools do you have to overcome your challenges to deal with life? It's all about access to knowledge. And today, the access to knowledge is like unprecedented, right? It's like beyond, you can imagine. So the when and that's the redemption of humanity, wisdom, knowledge, using it, applying it. So we are moving into an age. So in our decade, that this started in 19, uh, no, it started in 2020. That's the the this the age is the age of bliss, of 10 years of of huge bliss that coming from above. What's the problem? If you're taking that bliss in selfishly, it will burn you, create a pandemic. You'll have to stop. Everything has to stop. And also a lot of secrets come up to the surface. All the, the, the rotten stuff. So everybody realized together, if you think about it, demo democracy has to be reinvented. Nobody believes it, in it anymore. Economy has to be reinvented. You can't... It, it, Whoever learns about politics and about economy, everything has to be reinvented based on grace, love, sharing, and which is basically the, the godly uh, loving kindness that has to be awakened. And that's why humanity grows right now through a, like this decade. It's going to be very, very uh, teaching to really basically... Uh, uh, come out of the materialism, come out of, you know, you want to feel happy, uh, okay, take some stuff. Go to a very exciting place. And that does not satiate you. It doesn't satiate you. It has to be spiritual grace that you need to connect to. And the, that this decade is very, very uh, oppressive. So the system, the old system are falling apart because it's very strong was very similar the last the previous decade right but it's another stage the previous decade how many regimes fell apart you know the american economy fell apart the world economy now it's like being held like with a kind with a uh, band-aid correct it's not really holding but it's you know make belief but people whoever has a mind starts to realize it cannot go on this way it has to be changed. It has to move into more love, grace, and kindness. And that will take place of the uh, uh, elusive, uh, how would I say, civilization, that everything is great as long as you have nice stuff. Correct? And, yes. Exactly. And, and a lot of people had the time to think during the pandemic. And they realized the way we live, we don't like it. So a lot of people change. I see a lot of people changing direction in career, in relationships, family. Suddenly you realize you're lonely. Okay. You didn't invest in creating true relationships and you need to do that. So you see around a lot of people really started to invest in engagement, in creating a community around them because they realized, you know, without that. So I have a beautiful place, you know, but 
you know, Aquarius, one of the things of Aquarius, the tiku, the correction of Aquarius, very similar to the Gemini. It's all about, wow, wow, let's be in touch. No emotions. Stop and feel. Be there. Stop the rush. Don't run anymore. Be there. Stay there with the person and get deep, right? And, and Aquarius is about teaching us to go deeper. Otherwise, you really suffer. So that was one part of the pandemic. Another aspect of the pandemic is there's a symbol in uh, the Talmud when talking about the, the, the ages, that our generation, our time in history. And there's a speaking about uh, there are some people waiting for redemption religiously, but they never bother to change themselves from, in, from the inside. So, you know, those people that want the government to do it for them, they blame their parents for their misery. They blame the teacher in high school for them. You know, these kind of people, the victims, the pro it, and those victims, they cannot be redeemed and stuff like this. And the, and the town calls it the bats. It's a bat. The symbol is the bat, right? And, you know, everybody, the beginning of the, uh, the bat was a symbol of Corona right yes, and yes. that that is related to the rooster the rooster so the story is like this the Talmud says you want to know about the last days it's like a rooster and a bat in the middle of the night they're sitting there waiting for sunrise and then the rooster is asking the bat uh just a second you know I know what I'm waiting for because the light of sunrise is mine I announce it so it's but you it's painful for you the light is painful for you what are you waiting for okay so the person the rooster is a symbol of the person that it doesn't matter how dark things are he knows things are going to be better he's he, he sees the light in the end of the tunnel and therefore he is never a victim okay so those people in our in our reality they grow because creativity nowadays, like never in history, it was so, so open for everyone. You can create whatever you want. It's amazing. You create your website. You can, you know, you create your own uh, product and publish it. And never ever in history, people, you create your own content and share it with millions of people online, right? You can do so many things. And the boundaries are almost like being going away with the time. And those people, the bat like, they're always complaining about, you know, the misfortune. And you're waiting for the age of Aquarius, it will be horrible for you because you can't stand people happy, creative, and successful because, you know, misery likes company. So you so that's why. Where did the coronavirus hit? in the lungs, right? And the immune system. We know how lungs are, co are connected to being hurt. People with go with the hurt thing, they're very susceptible with their lungs. So, and also when you're busy being a victim and you're depressed and upset, your immune system is being abused. You know, we all know it could be the middle of the winter and it's dark, let's say you live in in an area in a, in a country, not like in the uh, southern, in the, in the Mediterranean, like we do, but let's say you live in London and it's so dark and and you didn't see the sun for days and you feel and somebody said something and you realize you have a bad mood and so on, you get the cold just like this, correct? However, if in the middle of that and you feel so lousy and you get excited about a new project, you're losing it in an instant. You're not sick anymore, right? Because you're excited. So when people are excited about life, you see those people, people were not hurt that much with the coronavirus. Who was hurt? The people that were so much into being hurt, which is not a lifestyle. It's like you basically hurt yourself. So you need to really rise above it because you can't just be outside the system. So a little bit about the uh, the corona. Wow, that's 
It's fascinating. So we're on, and that's not going to be the last plague, right? No. There's so another we see one. All plagues are coming, and whatever the, the old order is basically disappearing, you cannot rest on your laurels. People thought, you know, from now on, it's the end of history. You know, some people call themselves futurists. The end of history, from now on, the whole world is civilized. You know, you can be, be busy with your work, nine to five. You have your savings. You, you retire nicely uh, somewhere. No, it's not going to happen this way. The challenges still have to go on because we, as humanity, we didn't find ourselves yet. Our spirituality and our kindness and really caring for the, a genuine love to others. Not a, we love everybody, but we don't love our neighbor. You know, next door neighbor, or we can't live with a spouse or with family because we don't really know how to create the warmth of unity, of true uh, uh, sharing. So that's a lesson that we are going through right now. Wow. So could this decade be a decade of bliss that you mentioned? Oh, it is. It is. See? You just have to choose which side you want to take. You know, it says in Deuteronomy, and God is saying to the, he's saying, you know, I'm offering to do to you now, today, I'm offering you life and, um, uh, and good. And there's also death and curse. I offer you to choose life, but that's your in your hand. And here today you can see how the world is divided between uh, one side are uh, the people who really create and celebrate life with love and caring for others. And that will be, and then there are also the others who choose to be victims, who choose to uh, whatever not spiritual aspect of life, and there will be suffering. So you see just the, the, the economy between the two aspects of humanity, stronger and stronger. The happy ones that enjoy and they say, wow, we're living in an amazing, blissful time. And that is, what are you talking about? The world is falling apart. It's over. It's so terrible. And people tell me, you know, life is so miserable, so upsetting. It's so, we're getting worse and worse. And I say, do you know anyone who wants to live 100 years ago? Without, you know, without running water, without, you know, without democracy, even a kind of democracy, without, uh, without access to wisdom and knowledge that we have today, do you really want to go back? No, you don't. You know, still with all the terrible stuff we see in our society, we are much better off. This is the invention of Abraham, that he taught humanity to believe in the future hope when you have hope it means that everything is just getting better you need patience you need you need to endure you don't let the darkness take over like the rooster in the middle of the night and he's excited waiting for the sunrise because he knows it's coming well the bat is like waiting for someone to come and save him from his misery no one can save you from your misery only yourself Wow. Thank you. Thank you. This is its just such a delight to have you today. I'm aware that you have a time restriction, so I'm, I want to honor that. I wonder if we could just finish off. Well, just two yes. quick things, please. What yes. about the people in the Southern Hemisphere? Because for them, it is not spring when we have this Aries Gemini thing going on. How is that addressed? Uh, yes. So on one hand, we see most of humanity live on the Northern Hemisphere, right? Yes. And if you see the source of civilization is in the Northern Hemisphere, right? Because okay. you see, I, the, people I don't know. The, southern, you see, the people living in the Southern Hemisphere, they are basically, uh, their, their culture and civilization is brought from the North. Most of them, the majority, really? correct? The Aboriginals in Australia? I don't know. I'm not majority. No, I'm saying it's not the majority. I'm talking about the majority. Okay. However, when when you look, you know what's how do you know when you when you're in a ship and you're sailing south, 
How do you know you passed the equator? Do you know how you check? Very simple way to check it out. You don't know? Okay, so what? if you just you you uh, pour water into the sink, you know how, how it goes down, it creates a, you know, when it comes out, there's a, a spiral, right? Yes. It goes left side when you're in the north. When you're on the equator, it goes straight down. When you're in the south, it goes to the right. So the north is again the polarity between the north and the south is a polarity between water and fire the north is fire the south is water so you see people you see people from south america south africa or australia all of the south they have kind of more loving kindness with them did you notice that that there's something of more giving more kind openness it's the warmer people because that the no southern hemisphere has an overlay of more water. It's like emotion. It's it's more generous, while the north is more like, you know, let's take control of everything and conquer things and make things happen. So right. So the north is leading with the creation creation of the dominant civilization, economy, culture, political structures. So mostly, this applies to the north. The south, you just have to overlay upon it more uh, loving kindness that you find it because that the ruling energy in the south. Wow. Thank you. And also the word shalom. The yeah. word shalom meaning peace, but I think it has a deeper meaning than that. Could you oh, just okay. touch on that, so please? You know that, right. Okay, so we know, you know, in the same word in different languages contains diff like big different cycles of meanings. So peace, it, it's there's a Hebrew word in peace also that is that that means not to fight. Okay, the word peace in Hebrew, like the same letters, it's in Hebrew not to fight. Shalom in Hebrew comes from the word shalem, a whole. Okay. So when people meet each other and they speak Hebrew, they say to each other, Shalom, what does it mean? I'm not a whole without you. So that's a level one level above peace. You know, everybody wants peace, which means leave me alone, okay? And let me live my life. Shalom means I can't live without you. I'm not complete without you. Therefore, the, the Zohar says God created humans with so many different qualities and you see also the charts one is more into making money the other one is more into the crafts and stuff like this and we are not complete without each other same thing with civilization and cultures and nationalities you know every every group of people were created differently because the world needs them the way they are okay so there's a story about this great uh, Jewish sage from the 18th century in Eastern Europe. He was like a very pious person and very active in self-transformation and truth. And somebody came to him, you know, you're a source of inspiration. Like, tell me, who's your role model? Who, who do you want to become like? And he says, look, when I, if I, when I come up to the heavens, Abraham, the patriarch, they have already. Okay, Isaac, they have already. Jacob, they have already. Isaiah, King David, they have already. But they don't have me. And that's what they're missing. So I have to be me. I have to find out how to be the best me. So shalom means, first of all, you have to excel of being who you are because everybody else misses what you have to give them. Without what you, your mission in this world, everybody else will be missing that. And you have to find it in your own, in your own roots. That's one thing. The other thing is that you cannot really be complete without the people who are different than you because they complete you. It's, they're not different because it's against you. They're different because they're supposed to complete you. So that's why you see in the world that usually what you really want, you know, materialistically, other people have it. Why did God create the world with such injustice? And the answer is, so because you need their, you know, let's say their money 
or their uh, products and stuff like this, you must relate to them. You must learn how to be kind to them. Otherwise, they won't cooperate with you. So meanwhile, you get out of your Aries childish bubble, baby bubble, of like, you know, I want to be happy by myself. Don't bother me. And when you get out of your bubble, you meet others and you learn how to be complete with other people completing you. And then another secret, when you get out of yourself, you meet God. And that's the biggest surprise. Godliness is when you get out of yourself by being there for others and without ignoring who you are, right? You're being out there to give and to share. Then you find God. That's why, you know, the whole thing is love others as you love yourself. You're not doing anybody a favor when you do that. The first person you, you help when you do that is you save yourself from darkness and negativity and all the stuff that gives us the pain and the aches that, you know, we don't need them. It's not a must, but it's our choice. Okay. Thank you very, very much. I feel as though we could talk for hours. I appreciate your time and energy. Time. Um, if you want to check out um, Rabbi Shaul's website is livekabbalah.org. His YouTube is Live Kabbalah TV. The links are posted in the description box. And thank you so much for your time and energy and passion today. It's been a joy. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And have a great thank day. You. Thank you. Thank you.